With that being said, you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to the book of Acts. We are continuing our series this morning. We'll be in the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. Last week, we saw the first case of persecution against God's people over the miraculous healing of a lame man who was about 40 years old, been lame from birth. We saw how the early believers were positioned themselves to receive the Spirit by coming together, by praying, by desiring and expecting the Spirit to come and do these things. And the result is that the place they were gathered in was physically shaken by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and they were filled with boldness to proclaim the Word of God going forward. I would love to have been there. I desire to encounter and experience that myself. See, the emphasis of the text we've been in so far is God's unstoppable mission going forward. Because we are His, we've been wonderfully placed in His mission with Him and given His Spirit to empower and use us. And today, there's a slightly different emphasis in our text. It's a summary text that focuses on the church and our community living more specifically. Luke is taking an internal pulse, if you will, today in these verses. For the community believers, the issue is not only mission, not just mission, but also how they will function together as the people of God. So this section speaks about our community with two contrasts. On one hand, we have a people that have all things in common with an example that highlights it. And on the other hand, some people who are pretending to be part of this community with an example of what that looks like. On one, he has blessing, and on the other, he has judgment. We're going to see how God deals with these things within his people. Ultimately, what Luke is highlighting in our passage this morning is what binds the community of God's people together, what unites them, and it's Christ. Whereas last week we saw the first persecution from, of the gospel from outside of this group, today we're going to see a second form of persecution against the gospel that comes from within the body of Christ. We're going to walk through this text, making some observations, some connections, some applications, before tying it all together at the end, if you couldn't tell by your outline this morning. Normally, I would seek to tell you up front the big idea, the main point, so that we're kind of looking at it through that lens the entire time. But, but I'm not going to do that today because this text has multiple layers in it. And for us to go right to that point may cause us to miss some of the things that I believe God has for us in those layers as we get there. So, with that in mind, let's pray and ask the Lord to illuminate his word to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to save us. Jesus, thank you for sending the Spirit to empower and equip and minister to us. I ask that you would illuminate your word to us this morning. Lord, as we place our eyes on your word, that it would not just be words on pages, but that it would be your word come alive. That it would have its fullest effect in and upon us. That we would hold our lives up to this truth. And Lord, where we need to change, that you would give us the grace to confess and change. Where you want to encourage us, Lord, let us be encouraged and run all the more, Lord, to you. Pray, Lord, that you would be glorified through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as you see in your outline, we have two, three very simple points. The first is be like Barnabas, not too complicated. I think we can all remember that moving forward. So let's read chapter 4, verses 32 through 37 together. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. 
And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. These verses are a wonderful picture of the, the believer's love for one another and their growing community. Their, their community, this, this gathering of people is, is still forming. It's, it's, if you will, evolving as they are figuring out what it means to be saved by Christ and what the call he's placed upon them looks like. It's, it's centered on God's call, the mission that they've been given, and the apostles have been, are the main ingredients in their community at this point. And the wording that Luke uses to describe them is beautiful. It's, it's evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's really, it's grace on display, and it's something that your pastors pray for us continually. The full number of, of believers of one heart and one soul see this expression this expression is equivalent to one spirit and pointed to real true relationship that that they had with each other as they prayed as we saw back in in verse 24 as they prayed with one voice we see that they are living together as one heart and one soul. They were so spiritually in tuned with one another, with each other as if they were one person. This is what happens. This is what happens to people when they are saved and added to the body of Christ. They have the same heart and soul that belongs to their savior. And they have all things in common. That's what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that they have ceased to have their own personalities or preferences or unique traits that God made them with. When you are part of the community of believers, it's not some process of going through some, some molding or fashioning machine where you all end up looking and sounding and dressing and acting the same. That would be entirely too boring. The kingdom of God is made up of many nations and tribes and tongues of people that God made uniquely the way he did to bring him glory. And when those diverse and many kinds of people are saved by the one and only Savior Jesus Christ, they have been given an identity, a new heart and new soul that is far greater than the one that they had before. It's one that's actually alive now. One that has a heart that beats to live as God has intended with himself and with one another. What a, what a wonderful, what a, what a glorious picture of the early church that we have. See, a church, and this, by the way, we're going to get to it later in this in this. In chapter 5, but this is the first part of Scripture in the book of Acts where the word church is used. A church isn't an institution. It's not, a, it's not a physical building. It's not an organization. Having a building can serve the purpose of God, but it's not the answer to God's people. Because the people are God's church. See, it's a community of believers that are to be living with one heart. Get that. Listen. It's not just descriptive, but it's also prescriptive, meaning not just describing, but also defining, not only for the early church, but for us. A group of believers that are living with one heart and one soul for God and his ways. These people are connected to one another in a way that the world cannot understand. It's confusing. It doesn't make sense. 
not only are they believing in the one true God, they're actually living it out together. Not just in your heart or soul, but as it says in these verses, their unity of their relationships extends down to their very possessions. Because as it says, there were no needy persons in their midst, literally meaning no one was lacking in their community. People were providing for one another. Some were selling property and giving it to the apostles so that others' needs might be met. See, in the Old Testament, God's people were familiar with this. He had commanded them to care for the poor and needy in their midst. And providing for one another, they are not doing it out of obligation, though, at this point. This isn't a passage, let me be very clear here. This isn't a passage that is prescriptive of all believers everywhere to sell their homes and their possessions and give it all to the church. If you want to do that, bless you. We'll buy a bigger building and a bigger piece of property. It's not a passage that speaks of communism or socialism or communism. This isn't a picture for believers to pool their resources, to buy a compound where they all eat and live and meditate and take long walks together and not get angry and have wonderful utopian society together. Those things don't exist. Because as soon as one person's there, it's all gone to someplace hot. That is not what it means when they had all things in common here, see, because these believers were voluntarily of their own accord bringing their possessions because they had the heart and soul of their Lord and they wanted to display the love and care of Christ that they had received to one another. And they wanted to do it in a way that was both sacrificial and building up. And there is one particular person that's, that's highlighted as an example in their midst, Joseph, called Barnabas. Literally given a new name by the apostles. And his new name that he was given was meant to reflect the character, the life that he lived for Christ. The Bible has several places where they give people new names. We're familiar with one person who we're going to meet soon called Saul who becomes Paul. James and John were called the sons of thunder. I'd love to get a nickname like that. Be fun. No. Be fun to game for you all to come up with a nickname to describe your pastors as a group. You can submit it in writing. If it's bad, we'll tell you. Not to get sidetracked. Joseph so embodied the grace of God in his life that they were simply calling him by what he now is in Christ. The son of encouragement. What is typical of this group is modeled by Barnabas. He's not the abnormality. He's not the only one. It's a group of people like this, and Barnabas is an encouragement, an example to, to all of them. And this isn't the first time that we meet Barnabas, but it's not going to be the last time we encounter Barnabas at all in this book. This is the first introduction to a man who will play a big part in the chapters ahead. Barnabas cares for the poor here gives up his resources, but soon he, he welcomes Paul when others are skeptical. He encourages Paul by ministering alongside of him. He leads a mission in such a way that takes the initiative of engagement and testifies about the work of God to those outside and those within the community of believers. Barnabas is the kind of believer that every church would love to have. Be like Barnabas. I don't know if any of you, in a lighthearted way, have ever seen the commercial back a number of years ago. Now, goodness, actually, 1988 was when it came out. Um, I was thinking it was just a couple of years ago, but I'm still stuck in my mind, I think, about 15 to 17 years old. So a couple of years ago, meaning 1988, there was a commercial that came out about the greatest basketball player of all time and named Michael Jordan. And it was a Gatorade commercial called Be Like Mike. And it's like this, this wonderful song. Yeah, it's, if I could be, I dream that he would be like me. I want to be like Mike. And this is a wonderful picture of him playing basketball and 
blocking shots of toddlers that are trying to shoot into the basket, and it's making game-winning shots. I mean, he's the greatest of all time. It's this wonderful picture of a community of basketball lovers. Here's the, here's the one that most exemplifies. Here's the greatest one, and we want to be like him. And so when I read this this week, that's that's where I was left, is here's a community of, of believers, and here's this one that we can hold out in front of us to encourage us as we run this race and look to. Because we all need someone to look to at times, don't we? It can be helpful when we're not sure, what, what does it look like? How can I actually live this out? To have somebody modeling it for you, to, to be an example for us. And I want to say to you, church, that you model this well. There are many Barnabases in our midst. There are people that, that show practically the love of Christ to one another in ways that this could be your name written here. And so I want to encourage you this morning as you listen to this. This is not a, this is not a section where bringing a fresh perspective that you need to hear, but encouragement to you. Be like Barnabas, as you are already very similar to Barnabas. But there's something else I want to draw your attention to in this text. Without one particular verse in this section, we could easily think that this, all of this section was about how the church is to care for each other and have things in common. It would be a seamless section of Scripture if you removed verse 33, which you could, and be like, well, that makes it real simple. We'll just We care for one another. Here's how... We are to be in lockstep. If I'm not in one heart with somebody, I've got, a, I've got a problem I've got to deal with. This is how I'm supposed to be defined. Verse 33 doesn't immediately flow, immediately flow with the rest of these verses, and it stands out. Here's why. Lest the church take these verses and turn inward, Luke records for us the ultimate purpose of the community again. The apostles are testifying to Jesus with great power. This is an answer to their prayer just a few verses before. They are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone who would listen. The church isn't to turn inward. Rather, as it's on mission, as it's on a mission to proclaim the gospel to the world, it is also to testify to one another of the love and care and provision for one another that they've received in Christ. And look at how God deals with them for doing all of this. And great grace was upon them. Great grace is received not because They've received favor with one another and with unbelievers, but because of what God is doing. They are being a spirit-led and spirit-filled community. They are praying. They are desiring, desiring. They are eagerly expecting the work of the Lord. They're living it out, which are all evidences of God's grace. And as they proclaim Christ and care for one another, God pours out great grace upon them. It doesn't say he stopped. It doesn't say it was a one-time action. And great grace was poured out upon them. Loved thinking about that this week. Because my definitions usually far, oh, they pale far in comparison to the Lord's. So when I think of great grace, I think of great grace, and then I'm overwhelmed because I think, no, God's definition of great is far greater than mine. Great grace poured out upon them all. I don't know about you, but, but I want that constantly. I want that always. Grace has been poured down on me. Great grace has defined my life, but I, I want, I, I need even more. This truth is not just about the early church. It's the same for us today. We don't do these things. We don't, we don't proclaim Christ. We don't practically care for the needs of each other so that we can earn God's grace. That statement is an oxymoron. 
We don't do stuff to get grace. Grace, by its very definition, is getting something that you don't deserve. We live according to God's ways because of God's grace. It's by his grace we are saved, and it's by his grace we live for him. And when we are faithful to live for God by modeling what we see here in the book of Acts, we too will have great grace upon us. I want, we need to want great grace to proclaim Christ to the world. I want great grace to care for my wife and my children and you, and I want great grace that touches every aspect of my life. How about you? And I don't think there's anybody in this room that wouldn't say, yes, I do. And as I mentioned already, I think this, that these verses speak to a strength in our church. So be encouraged, you are doing well in this area, Grace Church. But I also want to provoke you to evaluate your life in light of this scripture again. Maybe you're quick to help practically, but you're not one in heart or one in soul with others here. It could be for a variety of reasons. You're new and don't know people that well. You have an offense with some. Your preferences aren't entirely met in the way that you'd like them to be met. You'd, act, you'd have to sacrifice something you enjoy, either in your life or in your schedule, to make time for others. There could be many reasons that you are of not one heart and one soul. But let me encourage you to hold these verses, hold God's word up to your life and heart and apply them so that you can be of one heart and one soul with the people sitting next to you and in front of you and behind you. And I do promise you, because God's word said so, that as you do that, great grace will be poured out upon you. This theme from our text of meeting needs will surface again and again in this book of Acts. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time thing. The unity of heart and soul in this community is transparent. Not only do they declare the word of God powerfully, they make sure that each and one in the community is lacking nothing. Get this. Community life means both mission and mutual care. It's not one or the other. It's not one over the other. It's mission and mutual care. The community of believers share the goal of reflecting the unity and reconciliation that Jesus brings through practical and concrete means. So, be like Barnabas. And don't be like Ananias or Sapphira. Let's read verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5 together. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. 
Immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her alongside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Quite a contrast, isn't it? One heart, one soul, great grace, great example. Somebody lied, they're dead. In contrast to Barnabas stands the deceit of this married couple. On the outside, at first glance, they appear to be the same as everyone else. Both are selling property and possessions and bringing them to the apostles to meet the needs of others. But, but where Barnabas was an example of the integrity of this reality, Ananias and Sapphira are an example of the deceit and judgment. They are a warning example to the early community of believers and for us today. And I want to draw your attention to a few details in this passage and why they are important this morning. See, it was their possessions. It was their money to do with as they pleased. They weren't required to sell this or give any of it to any of the community. They sought to deceive the community by saying they're giving the full amount when they really held back. Meaning, say they sold it for $100,000, but they said they sold it for fifty, and they're giving the fifty and keeping the other fifty in their pockets. It's deceit and hypocrisy that they are judged for, not what they gave. Satan is attributed with being the instigator of their deceit. Peter says it directly in addressing them. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? This is one of his strategies to thwart the gospel going forth and having victory in a sinful and fallen world. Where persecution against the community believers failed when it came from outside of them, now persecution is coming from within their ranks. But as we see, it too fails. God cannot God can not be overcome by anyone or anything. Many have debated whether Peter is the major figure in this text. I'll tell you, he's not. God is. Peter is the one interacting. He's the one filled with the Spirit to discern what has taken place, but he doesn't pronounce judgment. Never once does he pronounce judgment, nor does he have the power to carry out that judgment. God is the major figure in these verses, in this text, as he always is, and it's him that they are attempting to deceive, not, not Peter, although they didn't see that connection. He deals, God deals with them swiftly and justly. The response to both of their deaths is, uh, I think, as you would imagine, fear. I know it would have been mine had I witnessed this. Imagine being there and witnessing this scene. It's just like people are gathered around, having fellowship before the service starts. And walks Ananias, talking to Peter, just having a conversation right over here. He's dead. There's a new job description for young men in the church. It's your responsibility when somebody dies to carry them out and bury them. Imagine, I mean, just the the fear that would come from that, the, the what on earth is going on. And then a few hours later, it's, well, where's, where's Sapphira? Nobody's seen her. Here she comes, all of a sudden talking to Peter. Ananias was the one that came and lied outright. Sapphira was given an opportunity to confess before she responded. Completely unaware of her husband, but she has agreed with Ananias ultimately to try to deceive the Lord. In short, this is a difficult passage because to quote one author, Daryl Bach, in short, this is a difficult passage because the judgment against Ananias and Sapphira is instantaneous and direct. This judgment indicates how serious 
sin is to God and how gracious he is in often deferring such judgment. Most sin is not treated so harshly, but at this early stage, such, divine, such a divine act serves to remind the community of its call to holiness and its loyalty to God. God sees and knows all. Sin is dealt with directly. The resulting fear that the judgment creates is exactly what the passage seeks to engender. Respect for God and for righteousness, as well as a recognition that sin is destructive and dangerous. I'm fairly confident we don't think about our sin in that stark of a contrast regularly. Most of it is I'm, I'm aware of sin and temptation. I'm working on things. I'm, I'm seeking to apply God's grace and grow in these areas. But sin is destructive. And we deserve at any moment to be struck down because of it. But we aren't because of God's grace. We, we should have let me encourage you to have this type of you when it comes to your sin. You're either killing it or it's killing you. There's no in-between. There's no toleration. There's no, well, we're going to figure this out. There is the grace of God that's sanctifying, that's taking its work over time, but there's no standing still in this fight against sin because it's that serious. It's not just a, a personal thing. It's not just a, we'll figure this out. It's dangerous, as we see in God's word. And as hard and as difficult as this, and as shocking as this passage is, it's also helpful to us. The church is not a place of perfect people. Oh, it's not a, no. Oh, as soon as one person walks in the door, as soon as one of your pastors walk in the door, it's a place, not a place of perfect people. So often we read Acts and romanticize over what we see. Oh, we sh why aren't we seeing this today? We, we should be seeing this everywhere. The Spirit should be shaking the walls. People that have illnesses all of a sudden made right. People coming back to life. People want Wayne's shadow to fall on them. You all should have note sheets that are full for you. <laughs> Church is not a place of perfect people. We should absolutely pursue and expect to see God, expect to see God do in our midst what he did in this book. Without question, we should have faith and eagerly desire because God has not changed. He's still the same God and he still acts and his unstoppable mission is still going forth today as it was in these days when it was recorded this way. But we can over-idealize it at times if we're not careful. And this incident shows that even in the earliest days of the church, it was not a society of perfect people. Luke is showing his readers that they shouldn't overestimate. Oh, they shouldn't overestimate their unity or their sanctity. And this serves as an encouragement to us because if we're supposed to be picture perfect, if we're supposed to see the things that are happening in this book in our midst today, we could feel like we're failures. I don't remember the last time the stage shook or 3,000 people walked in the door because somebody preached the gospel message. So then by those definitions, we can be tempted to feel like we're failing at doing this. But this is helpful because it shows that God's church is made up of people who fail just like us. And we can thank God that we haven't experienced his immediate judgment and execution because of Jesus. It's because of the grace of God that he has patience for us. And we know from his word that he has patience so that in his judgment, in his forbearance of ultimate judgment, so that more might know him as Lord and Savior. And like the early church, this should also be, as it's helpful to us, it should be a warning to us to not overestimate our unity and our holiness before God. Your pastors aren't monitoring your finances to see if you're really giving what you say you will. We've not asked for you to sign a pledge sheet. 
that says, I'm going to give this amount of dollars this month, this week, this year, in my lifetime. We know what the Bible teaches and says, and we seek to obey it. So I'm not so much concerned about the financial embezzlement of your money. However, we all have areas that we could be tempted to deceit and hypocrisy in before the Lord. We can appear that we're all in on God's churches, God's church and His ways. We can talk and act and appear like everyone else around us. We've got the verbiage down. We've got the motions and singing and praise down. We know what questions to ask. We've got a few Bible verses on hand that we could just call to mind and we're in community groups. But this lesson should remind us that God sees and knows all, even the parts that no one else does. Let me ask you a question. Are you deceiving the Lord and his church in some active way right now? That's a heavy question. It's a significant question. It's not one that you should just immediately answer. Are you participating in church and community groups, but outside of those time slots, you wouldn't even know God existed in your life if it weren't for attending those things? Are you actively lying about an area of your life? Do you have an area of your life Oh, and this one is a helpful, this one was helpful for me. Do you have an area of your life where you would be described as a hypocrite in the church? Hypocrisy is dangerous in the life of not just each believer, but in the church and the people of God. I don't bring these up because I enjoy it. I, I don't enjoy considering deceit and hypocrisy I bring them up because we have a real warning from Scripture. I bring these up because I bring these up because I care for you and your soul. And I recognize the temptations in my own heart to be a hypocrite in my life. And listen, we're faced with many temptations to be hypocrites all day long, every single day day we are all familiar with the temptation to sin and so we rightly should fear the Lord when we read this passage in Acts and but for the grace of God that would be us if you are deceiving the Lord and acting as a hypocrite the good news this morning the good news is that God has not struck you down you can still confess it to the Lord and better news, receive forgiveness and grace. Jesus died to save you. His blood can make the vilest sinner, and in this context, the hypocrite clean. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for salvation and patience in your life as you ask this question. It's only by holding fast to reminders of, your, of the grace of God in your life and the accomplished work of Christ that you can even ask this question in your life without having, falling into a tailspin of self-introspection and depression. We must shine the light of God's word deep into our heart and deep into our lives to expose the areas that we need God's grace to not only intervene in but change us in. But we must do that aware and with and equipped with the grace of God. See, and as, as we do that, as, as we live pursuing holiness anchored to grace because all of your life is grace pursue holiness as we see here 
And as you know, it matters. So don't be like Ananias, Ananias or Sapphira. Rather, be like Barnabas. So what does this mean? What's, what's the, the main point? I left you a lot of space in your notes for you to take a lot of notes here. As I mentioned this there at the start, there are many layers to, this, layers to this that I did not want to miss or emphasize less or skip over. And there's also an ultimate point that we cannot miss in this. So this section of Scripture has much to say that is important about our living together. We are called to be on mission, as a review, just on mission of the gospel, mutual care for one another. We are to be of one heart and one soul. We should be aware of one another in such a way that we're not just caring for each other's souls and hearts, but also practical needs. We must use wisdom and not neglect the needs that are among us. We can be sacrificial in our caring for one another, where the Spirit prompts us. We must live with integrity together and before the Lord. We must pursue holiness and repent of any form of hypocrisy in our lives. These are vital and necessary truths and applications for us in being the church of God. But each of these things are not the main point of these verses. This isn't a passage that is ultimately about our unity together. The main point, what this is all about, is our unity with Christ. What unites us, the greatest thing we have in common, the one thing that we're all about is Christ. The reason that the church is to be of one heart and one soul is because we are in Christ. It's his heart and his soul that we are to have. He is the greatest thing that we all have in common to use the verbiage that is in the first part of this text this morning. And as the body of Christ, think about that image, as the body of Christ, our living is to be pure and holy without deceit or hypocrisy or sinfulness because to be defined by those is to bring reproach upon Jesus himself. And God can't allow sin in his presence much less in his bride, the church. We are to be like him by pursuing holy living that accords with Jesus. There's a passage that I believe comes to mind that will serve us in helping to understand our unity with Christ and with one another. If you have your Bible and you want to turn there, you can to John 15. If not, you could just, you could just listen. I will not read it too fast. As you can hear and see and understand our unity with Christ. From John 15, 1 through 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Hmm. The unity we have is from because of Christ. The identity we have is Christ himself. Everything about us from the mission we're on to proclaim the gospel, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, to our mutual care for one another. 
should be distinctly of Christ and directly proclaiming Christ. Our unity, the, the church's unity, is located in our identity in Christ. The identity of Christ is that we are united in. It's the greatest thing about us in any form or attack from without or within. Any form of deceit or hypocrisy is an attack upon Christ himself. God pours out grace and blessing upon his people when they are rightly living out their unity and identity together with him. He will not allow anything to stand against him from without or within his church. Our unity with Christ is designed, it's meant to proclaim Christ to everyone. We are to reflect Christ in all of our living. In, in light of this, in light of this reality, fear hypocrisy. Not because you're scared of it, but because you fear the Lord. You desire to give him the greatest glory, to, to shine of him, to reflect him. Pursue the kind of holiness that accords with Christ himself and remember how God deals with his people when they do this. Not only the powerful testifying of Christ where, where, where unbelievers are being saved, where needs are being met, where Christ is being testified to you and the effect is that great grace will be upon you. Not maybe. Not possibly. It will be upon you. See, I'm finishing with this as the main point because this isn't a message designed to scare you into living for Christ by finishing with Ananias and Sapphira. You should rightly fear the Lord. He's not your best buddy. He's not the person you just can hang out with and kick it and just be yourself with. This message is, is not about not messing up for Christ either. Don't, don't, don't mess up. Here's why I'm finishing with the main point at the end. Here, here, here's why this, this matters. When you need an answer, when you need an answer to the why questions in your living and believing in God, you have it. This is the answer to every why question in your life. Why should I live this way? Why should I serve that way? How, why should I believe this way? The answer is never, well, it's, it's because what, this is what we do. We're Christians. This is what Christians do. That's not the answer. We can say because the Bible tells us explicitly, this is why I do it, because it says right there, do this, don't do that. It's never, this is what we do. It's because you are united to Christ and he is your identity. That's the answer to every why. Why should I be sacrificial? Because I am Christ and he sacrificed all for me. He is the single greatest thing about me. And my life is proof of God's grace at work and even the vilest of sinners and in the the greatest of hypocrites. And I want nothing more than to be a display that shows Christ everywhere and in everything to everyone. Not just to unbelievers when I maybe get up enough courage to speak the gospel to somebody, but to my brothers and sisters who I stand alongside on Sundays and sing and proclaim the glories of God with, when I sit in community groups and open up my life and invite their input and questions, when I share my, my struggles. It's not about me. 
Church is not about us. It's Christ, his glory, and spreading his name as far as we can go. From the person sitting right next to you, to the neighbor on the one side of your house, and to the other side of the world. And I can't get away from the effect that it has when you are all in. When you are all in Christ. We use that phrase a lot, don't we? Are you all in? Are you all in? It's not just are you all in and what the church is doing. It's not about some plan that we as a pastoral team have come up with. <laughs> are you all in in Christ? Or are there some areas of your life that are still outside of him that would be defined as either hypocrisy or deceit or laziness? The effect of being all in in Christ is that grace upon grace, favor upon favor will be upon your life. That is not a prosperity gospel statement. It's not a, if you do these things and live this way, you're going to have riches and wealth and vacation homes. It's not, that's not even in the picture here. You don't get grace because you have earned it or made the right choices or are doing the right things, ultimately. But you are receiving a greater and more intimate relationship with God himself, and that is grace upon grace in your life. In closing, I'll invite Manny to come back at this point. In closing, I want to encourage you to take time today and this week to review this scripture, this message, the, the, the details and the main point together. There's a lot for us to evaluate us against in this passage. Husbands and dads, I want to speak to you for a minute. I want to encourage you in something. I want to encourage you to bring this up with your wife if you're married and your children. Not only invite their input into your own life, which could be a hard thing to do, because you may not like what they have to say, or their evaluation not, might not be as good as yours is of yourself. But invite their input into your life and lead them into evaluation and applying the wonderful grace of God that is found here in their lives as well. Wives, let me encourage you to bring this up with your husband. Don't wait for him to come to you. Seek him out. Ask his input. Invite his evaluation. Not only for how you do in these things, but also the evidence of God's grace at work at your life as well. Children, whether you're an adult child or a child, ask your parents those that know you best for time to talk about this. Not just a, hey, can we ride in the car for a few minutes, but can we have a, a few minutes to sit down undistracted to talk about this? Because not only do you want to receive the grace of God, but you want to reflect the glory of Christ in your life and you want it to be seen and shown that you were all in in Him. Take time in your community groups this week to talk, ask questions of each other, and apply this to your life, not just generally, but specifically. Which means, at least in using some wisdom, usually take some preparation of your own heart before community group so that you're better equipped to be able to engage those things. as is the case with the gospel, as is the case with God's word, as the case with many things. This reality of our unity with Christ, our identity with him, is something that we're never going to move beyond, but only into a more fully and greater understanding of. And I think it's appropriate that we declare Christ through song as we close, but before we do that, I recognize that the Spirit could have been working many different ways this morning could have brought conviction and, 
and areas that you need to repent of. Could have brought encouragement. Could have given you ideas and exciting ways to be able to be of one heart and one soul with the people sitting around you. Maybe just asking the Lord, do these things. Make, make it clear to me. I believe that earlier the, the, through the theme of our singing in this message that there may be some here who are like a child and have many toys in front of them that are of great value to them. They're of great worth to them. But you've lost sight of the giver of those gifts. You love him, you're aware of him. But you prize and value and your attention is in other places. Your heart is divided. I believe God would remind you of his word this morning. There is nothing that rivals him. There is nothing greater than him. He is all you need. I believe that that's you. He's calling you through prayer and confession to lay down those areas that you prize and value too highly and to ask for a greater passion, a greater affection, a greater devotion to him alone. And he's a God who's not sitting back saying, let me see if they pray and ask the right way. He eagerly desires to give that to you. So let me pray for you before we stand and sing.